Welcome everybody to the Brookfield Old Town Hall. I'll stand over here. Whether you have come to many of our events in the past or this is your first event, we welcome you. Our events are open to everybody in our communities and we are here to serve those communities and try to bring us all together. Uh, if you did not receive our events postcard in the mail, there will be event postcards on the back table. Almost all of our events are offered to the public for free. We do have certain events like big music concerts, etc., where we do charge a, a small amount of admission, but most of our events are free. And they're sponsored through grants and business advertising donations that we get from area businesses. And uh, the Frankenberg Agency of Randolph has been our lead event sponsor for as long as I can remember, and I've been doing this for 15 years. So we really appreciate Frankenberg Agency, and we have many other local area businesses who've supported us over the years. We do need to return net donations back to the Brookfield Community Partnership. That's what keeps the lights on in this building. That's what pays the maintenance and the insurance and the utility bills and the water bills for this building and helps us with any renovations and restorations we need to make. So we do ask that you make donations in our donation box in the back. We're running a little lean this year, so we really, really could use the support. So I will turn it over to Allison to introduce our guest speaker. Thanks, Linda. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Um, my name is Allison Belisle. I'm on the events committee with Linda and a, and a great group of events, uh, events uh, committee members. Want to give thanks to the Brookfield Community Partnership for their efforts in restoring and maintaining this beautiful hall, and to my fellow events committee members for all their hard work in keeping this uh, place busy and active. Um, we're grateful, as Linda mentioned, to the Frankenberg Agency, Insurance Agency of Randolph um, for being our generous lead sponsor for the entire season. We're also very pleased to announce Sprague Ranch as a new town pillar sponsor for the 2024 event season. Uh, we also thank our, our renewed event sponsors this year of Bar Harbor Bank, the Ben and Jerry's Foundation, Eustace Cable, CompuCount, and Gillespie Fuels and Propane. So tonight, uh, Flash Gordon Sprague uh, was born in 1938, and giving secrets, do the math, at Gifford Hospital. Uh, Flash's family has run Sprague Farm in East Brookfield, uh, now known as Sprague Ranch, since 1864. Flash left Vermont shortly after high school, but now returns each summer. Flash is here today to share stories of his life growing up in Brookfield, as well as the adventures he found in life after leaving Vermont. We're going to go for about an hour. Um, we'll save some time for questions at the end. And be sure to stay till the end. Uh, the numbers that you received coming in the door we're going to use to draw for some tasty door prizes. And off we go. This, this is a new duo sound check. Can you hear in the back? Is it too loud? Not loud enough? How's that okay? Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, my parents, my mother and father would have been very proud of that, but I'm not sure they would have known who I am today based on where I came from. I want you to give a round of applause to, to uh, Allison. She has been a big help. There's a lot of work in putting something together like this when somebody stands up and talks. Um, so thank her for what she did getting ready. <laughs> My wife is here tonight in the back. I won't ask her to stand. <laughs> I also have two guests here from, from Pensacola, Florida. One of them is John Batchelor, chair of the UWF University of West Florida School of Business, and he has an associate with him, Tim McElwain. You might not have heard of University of West Florida. There are more astronauts that have graduated from there than any University in America. They're 
they've been around 52 years. <clears throat> I have been ultimately involved with them for a long time on their foundation board. I'm on John's advisory board for the business school. I had a hand in putting together their football program. From start in four years, we were national champions in Division Two. If you Google me, you'll find a lot of stuff about Florida State, but we, we abandoned them. We're alumnus from there. But it's more fun to build a program than to maintain one. So we're going to start another football program in, in, in Florida as well. <clears throat> so I think um, when she asked me to do this, and she's an extremely difficult person to say no to. <laughs> Are you sure the volume is OK? <clears throat> Needs to go up a little. I'll try to talk a little louder. How's that? OK. And Keith had heard me say this once. This is a true story. I, was, I spent 20 years of my life as a national sales manager in the financial services business. And I was doing a presentation. And it was either in Seattle or LA. I'm not sure which. I did them almost every night for years. And I always try to ask somebody on their way out what they thought. And there were over 800 people there. They were outside in the hallway, were in the back, they were next door. They piped in the audio. <clears throat> so this guy approached said, I couldn't hear you and I couldn't see you and I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> so I want to make sure you can see me up here tonight and I know you can. So I agreed to do this based on the fact Betty wouldn't agree with this, but I don't like to talk about myself. Pardon me? She, I don't hire her as my coach, but she is my coach. She wants me to <laughs> slow down. So I agreed to do this based if she would ask me questions, and I'll try to come up with some answers. If I can't come up, well, I'll make up something. So go ahead. All right. So, um, uh, Flash, you grew up in East Brookfield on the farm that's now called Sprague Ranch. Uh, tell us about your childhood and what stands out with how this area of central Vermont now differs from how it was when you were growing up. Well, first I was the oldest of four children, so guess what? I got all the new clothes. <laughs> Had two younger brothers, Bill and John, and a younger sister, Joyce. She didn't get any my clothes, so she got her own, I'm sure. But once a year, we went to Northville. Uh, my uncle, um, Louis Morris, run a funeral home and a clothing store. We went to buy clothes for the family once a year. I do distinctly remember that. I remember all of our family members. I admired our aunts and uncles. We used to have big family picnics, and there would be 80 to 100 of us. My grandfather would always take a, a, a mason jar off a tree that was screwed to it, and measure us and weigh us, and each year we'd go back and see how, how how we might have grown. <clears throat> I remember every neighbor in the valley when I was a kid. We use most of that land today. I'm going to read you these, these names. I may miss some, but these are the names that I remember when I was a child, starting at the north end, where I was driving a truck for Keith today haying. The Allens, and the Lampsons, the Gages, you might not recognize those names because other people probably live in those homes today. Then the Farnsworth, and the Lampsons, and the Perkins in the village, and the Hills, my Aunt Doris and Uncle Ark, then the Martins, the Holmes, the Oshas, the Nichols, the Montgomerys, the Wheatleys, the Lampsons, and Silver Dome. I tried to buy that at one time to bring back dances, and my attorney at the time said, can't let you do that. It's too much liability. So what's changed a lot when I come back, and Betty and I come back every summer, the landscape is dotted with a lot more homes than it used to be. He tells me the population is the same that it was several years ago, but you wouldn't know it because today there aren't big homes or people scattered in a lot of different size homes throughout throughout the community. All right, so how many generations have Spr of Sprague's have run that farm? Uh, where did the Sprague family come from prior to settling on the current farm? 
Um, and are you aware of any stories about the early Sprague settlers? The farm currently is owned by Keith and Chelsea, and I wanted to say this before I forget it. Every family has a face. My grandparents used to be the face of the Sprigs in this town. My father was, my brother was, and now Keith is. Keith and Chelsea are the face of our family in this town. It's not some of us who might be older. This is a Sprague genealogy book. It goes back to the 1600s. The Sprague, there was a Sprague on the Mayflower. It wasn't me. <laughs> They've been around for a long time. So obviously they migrated up here from Massachusetts and what they did prior to that, I don't know. If you follow that name at all in Massachusetts, you may see Sprague Coil, C-O-I-L, Sprague Electric. So there's an awful lot of Sprague's that migrated here from, uh, from England. Remember the world was flat and they thought all oh, those people were let out of prison? They weren't jail bait people, they were debtors prison. So when you brag about your name, the Sprague's were let out of jail to discover America. That's how it really happened. Also, I admire this book. So if you don't have one, I know you're probably still selling copies. This, this, but good, the Sprague's are still in there. Um, and I, I treasure that book. I forgot the rest of your question, but. Um, do, how many, do you know how many generations back of uh, Sprague's on the current farm? Five. Five generations, 1864. Somebody asked me today, we have some guests here that are staying in the Chief and Chelsea schoolhouse, which is I went to the school there for six years when that was built. I don't have a clue. I know it was after the house was built. I, I know that for sure. All right, uh, what are some of your special memories from growing up in central Vermont? I think family was the thing I remember the most. They all were hardworking people. They all had heart. Um, my gosh, what a good looking boy that was there. <laughs> I didn't know they invented cameras that far back. <laughs> By the way, she's going to have a lot of different slides tonight that aren't necessarily part of my comments. But when I see one, I recognize I'll intercept it and say something about it. My grandparents lived in our family home up until my brother made a decision to divorce that contract. I admired them very much. They had two sayings on the wall that I've carried with me my entire life. One of them was, today is the tomorrow I worried about yesterday. I'll talk about Dale Carnegie a little bit later. You and I are our own worst enemies. 90% of the things we worry about never happen. Worrying about tomorrow isn't going to help you. The other thing they said grounds me whenever I think I'm too big for my britches. If everybody in this world were just like me, what kind of world would this be? Say that to yourself occasionally. If everybody in this world were just like me, what kind of world would this be? Uh, so do you have any special stories about your parents or your grandparents? Um, my, <clears throat> my father had uh, polio, I think it's called infantile paralysis. He had no muscle in one leg from the knee down. He milked 20, 30 cows his entire life, plus driving a creamery truck. Uh, the first year of my life, we lived on the little house just north of the creamery. And my dad bought the farm from, from his father because of the time he was driving a creamery truck, not a milk truck, a creamery truck. Um, our, our, you know, our, it was great growing up with, a, with brothers and sisters. Uh, we fought like hell. Uh, whenever there was a problem, we closed the garage door and go in there and settle it. When you open the garage doors, it came out and, and it was over. What happened in the garage? Stayed in the garage. <laughs> I was uh, very active in 4-H. Look at how bare the hills are behind that. Dad used to offer us a dime for every tree we would cut down. I think we cut down three. It used to be both sides were bare. Why were they bare back then? No, the cows were let out to pasture between milkings and they, 
and I read about the sheep in Vermont, yes, yeah, and also all the timber that was harvested here. Yes. So tell us about the schools you attended while growing up. Uh, where were they and how do they differ today? So uh, uh, Betty and I have moved 20 times. Uh, we're starting to give away a lot of stuff because we're sick of moving it. We've just given away all of our art to a college uh, in, in Pensacola. We've given a lot of our furniture that was in our lobby and had our cabinet to Keith and Chelsea to go into bread and breakfast. And I saw some things there today, Betty, that I'd forgotten that we had. Yeah, I, too loud? Come up here, ma'am. If you can't hear, sit here. Come here, I'll sit, sorry. Um, well, the question was about memories? The schools you attended. The schools, okay. Obviously, I went to the schoolhouse where the bread and breakfast is today. I went there for six years. I have told this story a million times. When I went there, the six years, there were never more than six of us in school. We were all brothers, sisters, or cousins. In Texas, they call those fence post relatives. I like that phrase. They paid me $50 a year to be janitor, to start the fire. There used to be four great big bulb lights like that. My mother taught me how to crochet the pole chains to turn the lights off. I started the fire in the wintertime. I plowed the, 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 the driveway uh, by hand so the teacher could get their car off of 14. I had a different teacher every year, and my father was on the school board. Now, I've traveled the world. I have never found anybody can come close to that story. And I'll talk at the end about what that's led me to to where I am today. I went from there to Williamstown High School. Uh, the only reason I went, went to high school was to play basketball. I wasn't that bad at the time. We were a C school. I don't know how they rank, rank them now, but C schools had, used to be less than 50 boys. B school was less than 100. A schools were more than 100. So Bethel and um, Randolph would be B schools, and we used to like to play them and beat them. The girls' basketball team, when I went to high school, was undefeated for six years. Check it out. They won 106 consecutive games. People used to come to watch the girls play, and guess what? Go home when varsity played. It didn't have but two rows of bleachers. There wouldn't be but just a few people sitting there for the men's game. So you left Vermont as a young adult to join the Air Force and then to start your career. Did you know you would not return to Vermont when you first left? No, I didn't. I almost did. I had fully intended to. I, <clears throat> some of the guys I played basketball with and all, all enrolled in the same day. I didn't want to wind up staying here, getting married, having children, and be drafted. So I chose to enlist myself and go early and get it over with. I think there were eight of us that went to Hanover, New Hampshire, and there was one guy rejected, and it was me. The lowest day of my life. I had to ride home on a bus. Went to see Phil Angel, the doctor, not Phil Angel, um, he was the state representative. Bill Angel. Yeah, Phil Angel. He was the family doctor who brought me into the world, I guess. He said he was in the military and he wrote me a letter and I went back eight days later and they let me in. God's taken care of me in many ways. Farm boys have mechanical aptitude, right? Are you, are you not going to make it? Every one of those guys that went in with me went to, went to engine school. Eight days later, I go to a jet school. If I had been with them, that's what I would have been. Those things are all slingers. I worked on B-47 engines. It's just the greatest job a mechanic could ever hope to have in the world. I was going to come back after four years in the Air Force to VTC, was enrolled, and I got to seriously thinking about coming back here, having lived in Tampa and Texas for four years. Um, so I stayed and got married. Worked full time, went to school full time, and put myself through college without any scholarships and no financial aid. Whoops, Air Force. Yep. How did you get the moniker Flash? 
I, I, I'll talk a little bit about racing maybe eventually if we get to it, but everybody thinks it's because as a race car driver. It has nothing to do with that, even though I might have been fast in some corners. It starts at Williamstown High School baseball team. It takes nine guys to play baseball, and there were ten people on the team. I could not hit a baseball. I rode the pine the entire time. I never played. I couldn't hit. By the way, one of my high school classmates is here, Edson Bigelow. <laughs> There were only, there were 22 of us in our class, and there were five guys, and there's probably only the two of us that are left. Is that right? He keeps track of all us. Yeah. So I, I go into service and didn't play sports. I did play semi-pro basketball in Tampa, a couple of different teams. I got out of, of uh, the service and went to St. Petersburg Junior College, where they have intramural sports. They don't have... In, in two-year colleges, you don't have fraternities and sororities, you have social clubs. So, of course, I joined one. We're playing softball. I hit a ball off a left field fence. It almost was a home run. I stood there watching it and was kind of trotting down towards first base and a guy threw me out from left field. <laughs> they nicknamed me what? Flash. I've been in sales most of my life, and I don't want people to forget my name, and, and so I, I won't let it go. And it's, it's stuck with me ever since. And I did drive, and there's a college president that introduces me probably 10 times a year, and he always talks about my racing stuff. That's not where it, it came from what you just heard. All right, so from reading your biography, uh, we know that you and Betty met and married in Florida in your early 20s, and you're still together over 60 years later. Congratulations. <laughs> so the question is, how did you manage it all with such a busy career? I was gone a lot. That helps. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we'd been married about 75 years, but she tells me this July it will be 62. 62 years, okay. That's her twin sister, by the way. Can you back up one? She was on the Queen's Court. We met in junior college. I tell a lot of stories, but most of them are true. She was engaged to be married when I met her. The greatest sales job I ever presented. <laughs> now, I'm going to catch help with this lady for telling this, and she's going to be upset with me. About six weeks ago before we came, she was at a grocery store and this guy comes up to her, she's about half done with her basket and she said, the guy said, do you mind if I ask you some questions? She said, no, go ahead. She said, my name is Bill, I'm single. If you know of anybody half as gorgeous as you are, I'd like to meet them. <laughs> Betty said, let me think about that. She, it, he didn't give her a phone number, so they never followed up, apparently, as far as I know. <laughs> so she comes home to me and says, what do you think? I thought, I think I need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I've always do, introduced Betty as my first wife and her two kids. That is an absolute accurate statement. She is my first wife. These are our two kids. I didn't say they weren't mine. I said they were hers, but they're ours. Our daughter is now how old? 57. 57. <laughs> and our son is two years younger. She lives near us in Pensacola. She's now a grandmother. We have four grandsons, two great-grandsons and one great-granddaughter. So that one's getting spoiled. She already, at three, she already has her own golf cart. <laughs> All right, so again from your bio, bio, I learned that you were involved with Dale, Dale Carnegie trainings um, as an aside to your public service career. Uh, there you stood out for your memorization skills. Tell us about that and any other memorable, memorable experiences from that training. That's one of the greatest things that ever happened to me in life other than getting married and having kids is taking that course. I worked for a guy that I admired very much. He was a great leader, great motivator. 
a great Christian. He had four children. I just thought the world of him. And he took the class, and I saw what it did to him. And I said, I got to have some of that. So I took the class, paid for it myself, um, and wound up teaching four or five other classes after that. As an instructor in something like that, you, you grow and learn more than the students do. The sponsor used to, a guy from Lake Wells, Florida, we used to invite like 80 people to dinner, and he'd get up on stage and tell about the virtues of Dale Carnegie, some of the benefits. And he would say, Flash, why don't you get up and tell us who's here tonight? Because I was at the front door when they came in and met every one of them. So I'd start right here and I'd go down this road and I'd go down that road. And right in the middle I'd say, oh, and I'd skip two people and I'd go over front and they'd say, yes, no, he doesn't know. And I'd go all the way to the back and I'd come back, oh, by the way, the two people I missed are right there, their name is so-and-so. You can do that. They say, well, I can't remember names. If the next person you met was worth a million dollars to you, could you remember it? Obviously. The greatest sound to your ears is your name. If you meet somebody the first time and you don't understand, say, would you repeat that? I've never heard that. Do you mind if I write it down? You pay them the greatest compliment by showing some interest in them and it helps you to learn their name. Let's assume their last name is Hershey. One of the tricks you can do is take a Hershey bar and just imagine yourself putting it on their hair. I, could, I, I don't do it so much anymore. And I, you have to practice those things to be good at it, but it was kind of fun to stand up and do that. I also talk, that's the guy sitting down that I that admired so much. He wound up uh, running the park system in Memphis, Tennessee. I followed him there. He wound up helping run the Olympics in Los Angeles. He's now deceased, but a great friend. You saw a picture of me water skiing with somebody. I, I, can't, I still can't swim. Think about the liability of this. I work for a city government teaching water ski lessons and couldn't swim. <laughs> that probably wouldn't happen today. That's the mayor of Jacksonville. Uh, when, it, when Jacksonville consolidated, Anybody ever drive through Jacksonville, Florida? The largest city in America, area-wise, 836 square miles. Uh, he brought me in as a white hat. They had just indicted a lot of people and put them in prison, and they brought me there from Pensacola. Uh, he, by the way, is picking on me. I was really thin then uh, because of my tan. The guy on the left, Julian Bars, replaced me. He's now deceased. The lady is obviously Betty, and she's very much alive. So in your public service career, running big city parks and rec departments, you had some very exciting opportunities and experiences. Some examples were the Jacksonville Rolling Stones concert and being in the inner circle with the NFL Colts escape from Baltimore in the 1980s. Can you share a couple of your most memorable stories from that era? Well, I could, I could give you hundreds of them. I was a wonderful career. Um, I just went real quick and I moved to West Palm Beach and I went to my office I, I, straight out of college as a park director, by the way, and I went to my desk drawer and down the bottom drawer there was about 10 bags full of coins and a few ones and fives. I called my secretary and said, come stand beside me, do not move, do not leave this room. Call the city treasurer and tell him to come here. He did. The guy that my predecessor was using that money to pay the Little League umpires. Four of my friends lost their job in Florida's park directors that year for misappropriation of funds. The largest one was less than $400. It's pretty easy to be honest with money. In government, that doesn't always happen. I did, we did court the Baltimore Colts when Bob Ursley was alive, when he was in Baltimore. I've had more beer thrown on me anywhere in the world, traveling around the stadium with him. The way they treated Johnny Unitas was awful. Uh, he milked us in three other cities to the limit and then moved in the middle of the night to where? To Indianapolis. A, a great, we offered him $126 million to move. 
and that wasn't enough for him. He wanted that and control of a lot of things. When the Rolling Stones were hot, they toured the U.S. and I forgot, I probably should have looked the dates up. But Memphis, Tennessee, had, and I'm sorry, Jacksonville at the time where we were, had, had, had Sidney Drashen, the promoter, had booked them for the, the Gator Bowl. The city council required a $100,000 cash bond to be left on the books for a year after the event. I had to go to them and convince them to withdraw that so the city could enjoy the benefits of the income we were going to make off the event. They were a little bit skeptical, so I took three people. I went to Memphis, Tennessee, which is where I wound up going later. They made $33,000 on that event. We made enough in Jacksonville, and the press wore me out, by the way. We made enough in, in, uh, in Jacksonville to net 101000 Every time they turned, we were ahead of them. We had the water hoses on at, at 6 in the morning when the dates didn't open until 10. Everywhere they turned, we were ahead of them. Only two people were arrested, and Betty and I were there at 2 o'clock in the morning driving through the parking lot. They came out with elephants on the stage. The final act had to go on stage before 9 o'clock at night, and they threatened not to do it. And the promoter came to me and said, well, what are you going to do if they don't do it? And I said, come to the window over here, we're up in the press box. I said, that's where the cash is to pay the entertainers. They don't come on, they're not getting paid. They came on. <laughs> They'll push you if they can. They'd like, they'd like to be out there all night, but you don't let it happen. So as you moved from uh, your public service career into the private sector, you traveled quite a bit, both nationally and internationally. Any memorable stories from those times? Yeah, I could probably write a book on just the things that happened to me on airlines. I was known as the cookie man. A lot of that time I lived in Dallas and they have the big chocolate chip cookies. I learned early on in life traveling. It was fun to travel when I did. I earned 8 million miles flying. I flew to St. Louis, may go from there to Singapore, then back to Toronto, then to Taipei, then to Hong Kong, then maybe back to Houston for a day. I, I, I traveled the world and it was absolutely fun. I could be five miles away from the airport in a rental car and never miss a flight. Try doing that today. Um, just numerous stories. Uh, it, it, was, it was actually fun. I was sitting beside a guy one day and uh, he said, you must fly a lot. And I said, I probably fly more than you do. And he said, well, I run the training center for American Airlines. Anything I can do for you? And I said, yeah, I want to learn how to fly one of these things. I am a pilot. I did fly. He said, why would you want to do that? I said, because someday the pilot's going to die in a flight, and the co-pilot's going to hemorrhage, and somebody's going to come out of a seat in the coach and land the damn thing. He said, well, if you think so, you show up on this day at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's not a prime time for pilot training. I never did go, but it was nice of them to offer. This is Bobby Bowden, by the way, the winningest football coach of all time. Some of you may have heard of him. A man, a, a, a devout Christian. Uh, Betty and I gave the biggest financial gift ever given to that university for the sports facilities. He became a very, very dear friend. Uh, he's sitting here in our motor coach. He called it a portable condo, which is quite an appropriate name for it. I used to carry him anywhere he wanted to go in the United States. He'd get He'd get in the front seat, fall asleep, and I'd drive him to wherever he wanted to go and bring him back. All right, your resume of both professional and personal pursuits is really long. There are so many exciting things that you immerse yourself in that it makes your bio a really fun read. One in particular I'm sure this group would like to hear about is your stint as a race car driver. You know, I, I always felt like I had the ability. I didn't have the access. You know, Keith works on a race team. He can probably drive their car anytime he wants. Um, I can remember back in our, our two-ton truck up to the Gage's house, there was a little bit of a hill there, and cars come around the corner on 14, try and beat them to the house. And people used to say to your dad, that truck you got goes really fast. Of course, he didn't know it was me doing that, but 
Um, about a year before I retired, I, I uh, started visiting a lot of racetracks, a lot of motorhome manufacturers. Uh, I went to a driving school in Kissimmee, Florida for three days, maybe five days. I got licensed to drive. I bought this car, which is the most famous race car in America for stock cars. This is the inaugural pole setter for the Brickyard 400. It's on, it's on loan to a museum, the best auto museum in America, at exit 209 on Interstate 10 in Tallahassee, Florida. At our death, we're going to give it to him. I'm going to give you the number, but appraiser-wise, this car is enormously valued. It can never, ever be replaced. I drove it for three years. I started racing at 62. I hired my own coach. I hired my crew that used to work in NASCAR. I would hire a track and go run, just get seat time in racing is what it's called, and just run, 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 run. Betty went with me all the time. She fed all the crew. When you go and run a track for a day, you pay for the corner workers, you pay for concession workers, you pay for the police, the fire, and everything else. And if you wreck anything like guardrails or fences, they'll send you a bill for that. And I, I did that too. I started when I was 62 and I quit when I was 65. I was undefeated that year and figured I'd do it Frank Sinatra's way, so I quit. Still have that car though. Thank you. Got to know all the NASCAR guys, a lot of them. So on the subject of cars, you created a museum for an antique car collection. I understand it no longer exists, but can you tell us about it? I can. Yeah, those of you that get on YouTube, type in my name or type in In Your Backyard. In Your Backyard. There's a 30-minute documentary on the museum of the cars behind this guy here. This guy here, his name is, is uh, uh, Kerry. George Kerry. He is the retired Archbishop of Canterbury. That is the equivalent to the Pope in the Catholic Church. This is the equivalent to the Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury. He came to Pensacola to do a fundraiser in our museum. He came to our house for dinner. Just an incredible individual and his wife is still alive. He doesn't come to America anymore. His, his children got control of him, but it's pretty special in life when God lets you meet people like this and become close to them. Just a quick religious thing. Of course, he did the service at our church. And Episcopalians like Catholics and others, you get a wafer and you get some wine. And when he did, he touched me. And my body was like on fire for one or two seconds. I've never had that feeling ever before or ever since. I said to my priest after he left, I said, why doesn't this ever happen when you do communion? He said, you had a religious experience. Uh, I got other ways to describe that, but it was, that's pretty special. Yes, yes. Yeah, Barbara Bush. The Bushes, we, we lived in Houston. We went to the largest Episcopal church in America. The Bushes went there. Harold Bakers went there. And we got to know them very well. I was under contract to speak in Dallas one year, and uh, they called me and said, we got good news and bad news. We can get Barbara Bush to come and speak. I said, well, fine with me. They said, but well, we want you to introduce her. I said, under one condition, I want her to, I want to have a reception for 50 people that she will come to prior to me introducing her. And she agreed to come. Linda came down, John's wife, to be with us for that. Incredible lady. She had just had herp surgery. The dais was no taller than this one. The table we were sitting at was right here. When she got done, she put her hand on the mic and said, hand me my purse. I put my hand on a purse, which is at our table. The secret service was on me like that. So I, I got up and handed, handed her the purse. She went over to the side of the dais to come down like three steps. And the secret service agent offered her the wrong hand. She just stood there. It didn't bother me a bit. I just went up and elbowed that secret service surgeon out of the way, offered her the proper hand. She came down, went out to the back, and the crowd stood up and gave me a standing ovation. 
just for being courteous to the president's wife of the United States. At the time, she had two sons that were governors. Uh, so you were um, very successful in a whole range of careers. How do you think your farm upbringing impacted your success? Oh gosh, I don't know if I've been successful. I probably couldn't keep a job is a better way to describe it, really. Uh, I think uh, having a heart has a lot to do with, with success in life. Tr you know, trusting other people, letting people trust you and see it's sincere. Having an uncontro uncontrollable work ethic. When I went to work in the securities business, the first nine months I was there, because I went to work in March, I led a team in sales. The guys that have been around for a long time, and ladies that were salespeople, couldn't believe it. And I said, you pay me enough in base, if I don't want anything in, in bonus, I'm happy. Well, they didn't think that way because they wanted to make, wound up, wound up doing very well and, and being very happy with that. But I told our preacher in church after the service, he did a great service this past Sunday on the heart. And I, I use this expression a lot with people when there's problems. Quite often, the heart is the problem. The heart of the problem. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. I used to have staff that would come to me and say, we have a problem. Some of the cities I worked for were big, like City of Memphis had nine golf courses, built the largest outdoor museum ever built. We had amphitheaters and indoor tennis centers and pro pro teams in every category. Wonderful, wonderful park system. So the person would say, we got a problem. It's never, I got a problem, or you got a problem, it's always, we got a problem. So there's four things I want to say to you, those of you making notes, write this down. You can solve these domestically, religiously, professionally, politically, or any other way. You can take any problem, you can solve any problem in, in the world, in the military if you can do these four steps. The first thing you must do is identify the problem. That can be tough. Identify the problem. Now the person that come in and say, we got a problem, they're the ones that are going to have to identify it. Then ask them to, to come up with uh, what caused the problem. What issues arose that caused these problems? Very telling. Then you make a list of number three of all the possible solutions. There's never just one. What's the fourth step? Pick one and number three. <laughs> That's just that easy. The military could solve any problem in, in a war can be solved that way. This is a farm tractor with Bill and John with me. Uh, look how bare that hill is. You know, the There's no trees there at all. I took that tractor to Florida, restored it, and when I had the big auction, I sold 2,000 items in a museum. And that backyard piece I told you about, it talks about the, the sale of the museum. It wasn't emotional for me. I had some pretty neat stuff. If I need another hot rod, I'll go buy one. Betty had her own. Our kids had them, but those are just things in life. And they're not as precious as people are, please. So how did you happen to become a publisher, and will there be another book? Um, that's that race car again. If you look real close, you'll see in the top right below the flashback letters, that's a football stadium. That's Florida State's football field that seats 86,000 people. This is superimposed picture put in there. I got permission from the NCAA to do this because I didn't sell any issues. I was going to have a big sale in Pensacola at one of our restaurants, and in Tallahassee, and Betty said, she's only said this once, <laughs> if you sell one book, I'll divorce you. So I gave them all away. Um, Allison found one recently about it. Uh, uh, throughout my life, several people, Bobby Bowden being one of them, said, y you need to write a story about your life. You need to write a story. And a sports editor, nobody will ever know who he was, said to me, you don't write a book to become a bestseller, you write a book to preserve posterity. 
So I hired a ghostwriter, his name is on the bottom, and we published this book. That was tw almost 13 years ago, and I'm in the process of doing another one. So I became a publisher in this process. I know what the definition of a perfect case-bound book is. That's a hardcover. I don't like Reader's Digest versions of paperbacks. So my next book will be like this as well. It's the continuation of my life because a lot has happened to Betty and I in the last 13 years. And a lot of it's here in Vermont. Was there a, was there a picture of me in a... No, right there. That picture was taken about 10 miles from here. I was awarded an honorary doctor's degree at VTC in 2013. I had to look and see what year it was. What an honor uh, to do that. After that, I did three other commencement addresses. From a one-room schoolhouse, that story I told you earlier, to doing that is something I never would have imagined. I probably spoke at Florida State 15 other times. I was, I was president of the National Alumni Group. There's 380,000 alumni. I'm president of that group. So every commencement I would speak, not as a commencement speaker, but try to convince them to become members of the alumni group. Um, it would take three and a half hours. We do three on a weekend. We do it three times a year. So that's nine times every year I spoke up in front of all those people in colleges. Yes. So there is, there is going to be another one. Our last question for tonight is, uh, tell us about your current involvement in higher education and your, the related aspirations. Uh, I don't know what my mantra in life is going to be or what my legacy is. I would like it to be that I was a strong advocate for higher education. I told you on his advisory board, eight days ago I was elected trustee chair of a local college in our town. There are 28 state colleges in the state of Florida. There are 12 state universities. I've been involved with every one of them. I have many friends, college friends that have been at presidents. I don't know why I develop a relationship with them. It's very meaningful to me. But being, being tied to higher education and what it means for the workforce in America today and the science, the doctors, the lawyers, the successful business people that come from those environments, it's special to be a part of that. That's, to me, that's the most meaningful part that I can contribute here on out. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we take questions from the audience? I remember when, we, I remember when the village store was open. I remember in the corner. I remember when the post office was there. I remember coming up, working on the farm, and getting on the dock in the, in the, in the what do you call the lake, the pond? Sunset Lake to cool off in the wintertime. Probably hoping some girls will be there too. This is a picture uh, taken a couple of years ago. That's John, my youngest brother on the left. That's Bill, my middle brother. Uh, that's me, and that's my sister Joyce. That's her husband Steve, and that's Linda closest to me. This is a dinner. I usually come up once a year during the wintertime for meetings. And I, that's why Betty's not there. We try to get the, I try to get them together. They always agree to come because I always pay for it, so they always come. <laughs> it's a family picture. Uh, I had a lot of buildings. Um, I, I also meant to say about my, what I'm asking for, I'm, I'm somewhat of a, a, uh, a political pundit. I'm involved with an awful lot of campaigns. The past governor, uh, Scott, you might remember that name now. A U.S. Senator appointed me to a board. Our current governor, you might remember that name from being a presidential candidate, DeSantis, he just appointed me to a board. So having political influence but not being a politician is meaningful to me. I have set up several advisory boards to advise, advise different candidates. I raise a lot of money and I don't want to be a politician. I like to be a part of that. So that's our family. I had a lot of buildings at one time. I'm back down to one. And this was, uh, in, I built Betty a tennis barn because I felt guilty of all the ones that I had. So 
So this is our family when they were younger. Um, they're color-coded by family. Of course, it's grown some since then. We'll have to update that. Yes. I think we're ready for questions from the audience. Does anyone have any questions? Don't be bashful. Come on. No questions? Good. There's not going to be a test. <laughs> yes. Let me get a hand to the microphone if that's okay. Yeah. Gordon knows me, so when you were down at the uh, one-room school else, did you ever have uh, Cesarine Stoddard as a teacher? Probably did. Yeah, she was, uh, she was my aunt, was my yeah, aunt. I, I, yeah. I must have. Yeah, I had a different one every year. I did. <laughs> no, no. I went there. I visited there one time, because Ruthie Stoddard's my cousin, and I, went, I visited there one, one day, you know, we had off. I went to one room school else too, so I know all about it. But yeah, uh, God bless you for for uh, going through that. Because I was the only one in my class. Oh, number one, in, you're the only one in your class. I, I was number one and only one. <laughs> <laughs> so this area means a lot to me. The family name and the heritage has brought with it over all these years. Um, I respected my parents. Love my aunts and uncles. Uh, I love what Keith and Chelsea are doing on the farm. I kid with some of our employees that I was telling one of them today, I think, I think if our grandparents came back and saw what we were doing, they'd probably pass out because they wouldn't believe it, it was possible the human beings to do what we're doing. There's 1,600 cows ahead, right? That's more, that's more cows than there are people in this town. Up until eight years ago in Vermont, there were more cows than people. That's not true anymore because of the decline of farms. There were somewhere between 10 and 12,000 farms when I, was in, when I was a young man here, living here. Today there are less than 400 in the state of Vermont. Just under 600, whoop, number went up. So this area means a lot to me, so I'll come back every year. Any, anything else? Any other questions? What was your favorite job? My favorite job? Whew, I, I loved every one of them. I, 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 I just love people. I love, love traveling. I love being, love being on stage. I didn't learn any of that being here. Um, people always just ask me, I guess I remember one of the questions is, where did you like living the best? Where you live does not matter. Who you surround yourself with as your friends is what matter. It could be Alaska where it's cold, or it can be in the equator where it's hot. If you if you like the people you socialize with, you're going to like that area. I, lo I loved everything I did, and I could I was never fired from any one of them that I know of. I was I had some big cities trying to convince me to run for mayor. In order to convince them to leave me alone, I would say I find that personally insulting. That was my answer to him because I just, I didn't want to do it. Didn't want to do it. Is there another question back there? Okay, I brought some goodies for you. They're going to draw some numbers here. Can I tell them what they are? Yes. These are pecans that are grown locally in North Florida. They're processed by a company in Pensacola and they're shipped worldwide. They are really, really good. A, a bag of them looks like this. These things are really good. So I, I got eight of them to give away. So uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't get a number, so I can't draw them. Who's 44? <laughs> Get him to draw the next number. Get him to draw the next number. You got to draw the next number.
And if you think of any questions while we're doing this, then I'm going to have you choose.